Eileen. Um, meet DJ Eileen, a rising star and the youngest talent in the vibrant Miami queer community. Since 2016, she's been making waves with her dynamic mixes, blending reggaeton, baila funk, Jersey club, dembo, and the best of Latin music. Eileen's fresh and playful style, influenced by her Latin roots and her Miami upbringing, is the magnetic force that beacons you to the dance floor. Having graced events organized by Miami's top queer women producers like Pandora Events, Eye Candy, She Life, Amave, uh, Eden Entertainment, Witches of Miami, and more, she has solidified her presence in the heart of the queer Miami scene. She has been a resident DJ at Shoma Bazaar in Durrell, and she has spun tracks at the renowned venues such as 1-800-LUCKY-MAMA-TRIED and The Anderson. You can experience her vibrant mixes and undeniable talent on SoundCloud. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. A incredible DJ. Incredible DJ. It's a back-to-back -back is going to happen. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming soon. And my also love. <laughs> uh, Miss Purple Shampoo. Miss Purple Shampoo is a NYC-born, Miami-based DJ, as well as the founder of Discoteca. If you have not been, you need to go. Period. Yeah. Period. Um, inspired by the music that they grew up on and their friends in the scene, they utilize genres like techno, disco, reggaeton, and everything in between to curate euphoric, high-energy experiences. Experiences that allow queer, of queer people of color to escape the outside world that's pitted against them and in order for them to feel the illusion of freedom and safety, even if it's just for a brief moment. Let me tell you, that shit is important. Thank you, thank you for that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, wow, did, oh, I, thought, I thought the order worked out perfectly, <laughs> sorry. Okay, um, SDRV, uh, SDRV, aka Steffi, is it Ringal? Is that okay, or like Ringo? Like uh, okay, okay, I, you know, I, I didn't know. Uh, keeps dancers bouncing with techno, 90s trance, electro, and acid. She has an exciting and unpredictable style on the decks. Growing up in Miami and having roots in Ecuador and Peru, SDRV enjoys adding tribal elements to peak moments of a set to embrace the culture and hard percussion of Latin club music. She also hopes to capture the hypnotic spirit of dark bass and the old school nostalgia that culminated back in the 90s. SDRV is the newest member of Internet Friends. Come on. <laughs> right? We need a clap for that one. And is also involved with WVUM 90.5, also. <laughs> and Miami Community Radio. <laughs> she is the current music director at the v WVUM station and hosts the long-standing radio show, Electric Kingdom Live in which she highlights local talent in the electronic realm weekly. Thank you so much. Woo! Thank you. Okay, Baphomet, you are up. Despite only appearing with the scene as, despite only appearing within the scene as a performing artist in recent years, Baphomet has blazed their path to being a ho household name to the ravers within Miami. An eclectic producer and DJ initially of the visual vocation, they have made a name of the for themselves through their emotional, cinematic, and genre and genre set combined with intimate, personal, visual aesthetic. Wow. <laughs> wow, you're really selling me right now. <laughs> uh, Baphomet has played sets in the brutalist warehouses within Miami, a bar barren forest in Romania, and even ab abandoned airports on the outskirts of Berlin. But on November 9th, they join us in Little Haiti, Little, sorry, Little River for a panel geared towards upcoming DJs where they will share their international expertise. That's so dope. I, like I told you, when I read that, I was like, an airport? <laughs> what, a, what a bucket list. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, an experience. Yes, I, we can't wait to hear about that. Vibraciones, my wonderful co-facilitator. Vibraciones de Them is a trans non-binary Colombian DJ, producer, musician, and transdisciplinary artist whose passion for music transcends genres and artistry. Born in NYC and based out of Miami, they have been classically trained for a majority of their life in opera, piano, and violin, performing nationally in choral and opera competitions since childhood for the likes of classical, classical singer magazine, Juilliard, okay, Florida Grand Opera, 
the Adrian Arsh Center and countless universities and classical music conferences. They are constantly fusing together inspiration from every genre. Their passion involves their passions involve community outreach, musical accessibility, and advocacy for the queer community. They are the creator of Fun Raver <laughs> and Transcendental, Transcendental, two event series serving QT Pac through dance, music, wellness, and art art events. They are also a resident and operations volunteer at Miami Community Radio. Um, Vibraciones is a 2023 recipient of the Teresa Velasquez LGBTQIA plus fellowship, a music industry and production mentorship created by renowned electronic music artist LP G O Giobani, is that, did I say it? Gio sorry, guy. And her mix a lot. They're also a founding team member and the administrative manager of Change the Beat a nonprofit which aims to help femme and gender expansive artists sign on to big time record labels such as Tool Room and Guan in Juna Deep and in Juna Beats. He, she, they, Sola, Lady of House and Cirque Dis, Cirque Dis Re uh, Recordings. They are also an insured fire performer, which they're fucking amazing if you have not seen them. Uh, book them. And a certified Reiki master teacher initiated in the the shamic, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, moon, thank you, writes. In their spare time, the enjoy, they enjoy spinning and playing with fire, communing with nature, creating trippy audio visuals, and learning about sounds and synthesis. synthesis. Thank you so much, babe. <laughs> Do you think you can read from there, or? I can read my own bio, which would be weird. I want to read it for you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It'd be weird to introduce myself. <laughs> okay. This is Mr. Bitch. They, them, is an Egyptian and Italian transmasculine DJ, producer, event organizer, and musician. Born and raised in New York, his musical journey started at the age of eight af when he began classically studying the cello. Throughout high school, he composed in the he competed in the New York State School Music Association and graced the esteemed stage of Carnegie Hall with the Long Island Orchestra. Okay, pursuing his passion, he continued his studies at Sunny Purchase Conservatory of Music, focusing on audio engineering, production, and taking up the guitar and piano. Post-college, he worked as an engineer at Jimi Hendrix's home studio in NYC, Electric Lady. Let's go, let's go. Rooted in the vibrant New York queer scene, his up upbringing helped shape his distinctive cunty and polyrhythmic sound that traverses various genres, including tribal, I'm a piano, vogue, by the funk, Jersey club, Afro house, early 2000s edits, dembow, Afro beats, and dance hall. He has spun at Miami's hottest parties, such as Winwood Pride, which is in Miami, Masisi, Prohibida, Sugar Rush at Floyd, Soiree, and Fun Raver, while also making appearances in New York and Orlando. He is the founder of Call to Action, a Miami-based fundraiser party dedicated to raising funds for trans individuals. Please follow and support them. Amazing work. Mr. Bitch's work is deeply intentional and impactful within his community. Additionally, he has introduced his latest series, The Gay Agenda, featuring global beats parties and hookah lights, a communal gathering celebrating Arabs and their allies aimed at di diversifying the scene. Soon to be announced, he will be signing with a local Miami record label. Mr. Bitch aims to continue showcasing his Bailey Jersey Club remixes. He is also a season four resident DJ with Miami Community Radio and extends his influence beyond the music scene as a board member of the Nicholas Gogan Foundation, a nonprofit that offers micro grants to trans individuals in need. Thank you so much. Can we just give one more round for all the panelists here? Yeah. Like a really, a really, really, a very, very talented group of people here. So I'm really hoping we can spread the knowledge and continue to, you know, learn from each other. Okay, so we have a few questions um, we're gonna get into. So the first one is for the entire panel. Um, it is how did you how did you discover your own unique sound and how do you redefine it if you need to? Anyone can go first if they would like. Don't jump all at once. <laughs> do I have to pick someone? Hmm. Let's pick someone. Eileen, how did you discover your own? I unique knew sound? it. I knew it. <laughs> 
Testing one, two, three. Well, it's it's been a journey since I started. I actually started about 12 years ago DJing, and what really inspired me was uh, very bassy music. Um, I started getting into like tech house and house music, uh, techno, deep house. So I felt like I was very much into when it comes to bass and drums. So a little bit after that, I started to also realize, you know, I'm also Latina. So I also like Spanish music and I like the combination together. You can always put like an acapella with something bassy and it sounds nice. Um, for me, if I need to redefine my sound, it would definitely be if I'm, I have like a private event and I ask like, what is it that you want that day for sounds? So I feel like I have to, if I have to put something different like top 40 or change it up, but still bring my own unique sound together, I think that goes well. Um, I can go next if no one else wants to. Um, mm, my sound is kind of a culmination of all the music that I've been listening to throughout my life. Uh, because like I've basically spent the vast majority of my life listening to music every single day, different genres, different BPMs, just listening to music for the sake of enjoying the emotions it makes me feel and stuff. Um, Discovering my own unique sound, I, I think it's something that I have within my subconscious. Like, if you ask me, I wouldn't really be able to tell you what my unique sound is, but if I, like, I, you know, you can hear it come through within uh, my mixes and my tracks and stuff. Um, as for redefining, um, I just kind of, I, I take breaks uh, to prevent being burned out, but I also take breaks where, for example, like, if I'll have uh, gigs back-to-back like techno gigs, and I start getting sick of techno, I just stop listening to it for a couple of days. I'll start listening to like some other stuff that I used to listen to way back. Um, like last week, I was listening to like 80s and 90s rap and like completely just delving into that and like admiring the different sounds that you hear within them because this genre has very specific sounds and like ways that the sound is shaped. Um, and it helps because I can take inspiration from that, you know, for my art. How about that? Um. Um. We can go with Miss Purple and okay. then down. Okay. Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. So, um, my sound, like you said, I also like. I mix a lot of genres. I love all kinds of music. I've always been attracted to alternative music, like rock, indie, psychedelic rock. Um, like electronic music came to me later in life. I'd say like around 2019, uh, when I went to like my first music festival, which was like EDC. Um, but then after that, like COVID, all that stuff, I couldn't go like out at all. So I was like, I don't know. But um, in 2020, uh, internet friends through used to throw like these small warehouse raves, like right near I-95, like it was super low key, like cops would raid it all the time, but I've, I just felt like some belonging there. And so ever since then, I just dove more. I would just go out a lot and um, I'd love the music that the DJs were playing, like the energy was just great. And I discovered so many different artists through going out and seeing DJs and meeting people. And like, then I would just go on spirals and yeah. Um, and as for redefining, <laughs> um, since I do like love all different genres and I practice a lot, um, I'm able to like blend it in a sort of like good way. I don't know, but um, I really find like if I see that it's like a reggaeton party, I play reggaeton, but I always keep it like weird and alternative. Like I try to. So. Um, yeah. I don't know if this is on. Um, I think my sound comes from my childhood, definitely. Um, my mom like played music like every single day, like especially like cleaning the house. I know Latino people can like relate. Um, and she listened to like like it was a big way that she learned English was through American music. So she listened to like every possible genre, and a big one was disco. Um, and like a lot of my happiest memories growing up are just like listening to disco with her. Um, and as a teenager, 
uh, my sibling Sardis um, and I shared in like iTunes account. Like I had an iPod, she had an iPod, but like we had the same account. And she was a lot older, so I had to listen to like her music pretty much. <laughs> and um, that like really jump started my love for music because she had so many different tastes. Um, and yeah, I think being exposed to so many genres made me like want to be able to try to like put them together, like things that you wouldn't expect to go together. Um, I credit my mom for that because like she listened to literally everything. Um, yeah, I think it stems from that. Um, and then to like redefine it, like everybody else said, like depending on the event, um, I'll conform a little bit, but I try to like maintain, like I'll try to include at least a little groove or like something that just feels like me instead of just doing like, um, you know, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I honestly, I can't really define how I found my own unique sound. I just remember liking like various genres growing up. My dad also listened to disco. He has like this insane vinyl collection. If you go to my house, it's like a bunch of like vinyls against the wall. He doesn't let anybody touch it. But I really, really enjoyed listening to what he listened to. So I had like a lot of Michael Jackson, Cher, Madonna, like all those like big 80s rock stars. But I also was like Steffi, like where I found electronic music later on in life. Um, mostly through like the people and the scenes that I was hanging out with. I like grew up doing a lot of classical music, so I was like really separated from that, but like I felt like, <clears throat> and I don't know, this is just me saying like growing up, you like really like start to discover who you are, you define that person within yourself. So um, I, I, I feel like that goes hand in hand with yourself as a musician and, and a DJ. So um, Right now, I'm like, I've always really liked house, I've always liked techno, I've always really enjoyed just like really underground beats. Um, but I feel like redefining it if I need to, I always just kind of like find a balance between what I like right now in the present, like what's inspiring me in the present. And I think this is why it's so important to go out and, you know, to as many events as possible so you can listen to other people's sounds, other collective sounds, other event organizers and what they're doing and, and like define like what it is that you like and what you want to do and how you want to move forward, especially if you want to like do like DJing as a career and stuff. But um, I also like try to like find like a balance between what I like in the future currently, presently and then um, what I found inspiration in the past. So um, like for me, that's a lot of classical music. So I'll like I like screw around with like some like classical music and like it'll sound weird at first, but I like it. And I mean like that's what matters. If you like it, you like it, you know. So. Um, for me, uh, if you know my sound, I'm very like open format. There's like kind of no genre that I won't play, but um, a lot of my sound, like our sound, is very complementary of each other. Like a lot of Bila Funk, a lot of Jersey Club. A lot of like very hype music, um, and that really stems from me from like growing up in New York. Um, if you've been to New York, you know that you can't. There's like culture everywhere. Um, so I think being exposed to so many different types of culture, um, also just like growing up in a household where like like my stepmom's Dominican, so like got exposed to dembo and bachata, and then like my dad is, my dad's Egyptian, so like Arabic music. Um, you know, I think I just have had a lot of exposure to a lot of different cultures, and I'm really grateful for that. And that comes through in my music all the time. Um, I would say that, like, my sound has sort of pivoted when I came to Miami. I've been in Miami for a year. Um, so, like, I think Miami's really heavy on the pedal with techno right now. Um, and I think what I pull away from that is, like, baile rave, or, like, some sort of subgenre of that, because I'm definitely not a techno head at all. But like I can appreciate really good um, subgenres of that Afro house. Um, I'm a piano, all that. So, and I think if you're like thinking about redefining your sound, because I'll tell you this: that like I came to Miami and I was not Mr. Bitch, by the way. Like I redefined, changed my name, went in a completely different direction. So, there, it's never too late to redefine you and your sound and rebrand if you feel like it's something's calling to you. So. Cool. Um, our next question is for everybody. Um, what is your process in preparing a set? Um, for me, 
usually when I get booked for a gig and like um, I know the theme for it, even if I don't know the theme, sometimes I'll go off of like context and see what that organizer has done and the general vibe of the parties and like really take in their culture. Um, and then I'll just go on SoundCloud and I'll like listen to music literally just like nonstop. Like I'll go um, like based on the aesthetic that I find or something, for example, I might think that like a certain playlist I have fits the vibe, but I don't really want to play the same playlist for different stuff. So I'll like go into like the suggested and then I'll listen to all those tracks and I'll just vet through them. So usually after like six hours of like, you know, doing like at work, doing stuff, uh, listening to music, after like six hours, I, like I might have the playlist and then I'll just spend like time until the gig to like refine it. Um, I'll throw it in record box. I'll like try mixing it, see how stuff blends, take stuff out, put stuff in. Um, and yeah, I mean, basically just go after what the, the party is it seems like. I love that. Um, <laughs> for me also, it depends on like the event. Like I'm really thinking about like who's my audience. And if I'm walking into a situation where I don't know, um, I make a lot of backup plans mm -hmm. in case I clear the floor. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, I think that, no, and then that's a real thing. Like I, if you're, listen, if you haven't cleared a floor, you're not a DJ. Like yeah. we all have done it. And it sucks. And it's you're like, damn, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> but like a good and experienced DJ will pivot very quickly. And so that's part of your preparation. So it's not just download a bunch of music and hope for the best. Because, you know, shit will go wrong. So just being able, to, I, I think that's part of the, the preparation. But same thing. I'll be on SoundCloud forever. Too long. <laughs> Too long. Um. I so agree with what you said. I feel like not enough, we don't talk about enough like having backup plans and not just like assuming that like one vibe. Cause like even if like I'll get booked for something and like they'll say it's like a vibe, but then yep. sometimes the vibe will be so different. Yep. Um, that's just like, that's just gonna happen. Like so much miscommunication can happen. Um, but when it comes to like starting out to prepare, I feel like um, depending on like the theme, for me, like I always associate the theme with like a specific song or something. Like um, there was a candy rave I got booked for, and for some reason I thought about that song um, from Lazy Town, "Cooking by the Book," and like I'll usually make that song that I am reminded of. Like I'll make that the intro, and then I'll build the whole set around that. Like because I know that that's the exact vibe I'm going for, and then yeah, I'll do the same thing. I'll go on SoundCloud like the entire night after that, and try to find songs. Um, that go, like, with that. Cool. Um, when I'm preparing a set, uh, if it's a set, like, on the radio or if it's a mix or something, I like to plan it in advance. Um, I usually don't plan sets when it's, like, live, um, at least recently, like, these, this past year. But I used to, like, heavily plan the set to create a story and make sure you're, like, always, like, feeling something some sort of emotion, whether it's like nostalgia or like you feel sexy or you feel like scared or something. But um, <laughs> like all of it. <laughs> but um, but for, for radio mixes, um, yeah, I definitely like take the time to plan it and like usually go from like lower BPM to higher BPM or like some sort of journey. And then, yeah, I download like hella music, um, depending if it's like a techno party or if it's like a reggaeton party. And then, then I have like my playlist separated in like moods so there's like, like I have like an acid playlist, like I love acid and it's like all those types of tracks. I should probably be more organized like my bestie Sylvia because we always go B2B together. That's also a different process to prepare, but if you just like click with someone, like it should just come natural, just like you play your tracks. But, um, but yeah, I don't really like separate it by genres, which I should, but um, yeah, I just download a lot of music. I go on YouTube, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, um, if I see that my homie just like released something, I like literally like obsess over it. So I will play your song and that's my process. Can I also, I just want to say something that you just brought up is like there's many ways to organize your library. Like I go by genre because I have so many different genres, but if you're like, maybe if you're a DJ and you're playing between two different genres, like does it really make sense to organize by genre or by mood? I do both. 
Yeah, like I'm saying that there's like a lot of different answers to that because it oh, depends yeah. on like who, I think who you are as a DJ. Um, I would have lots of crates if I did by genre, so. And even something like a detail as small as the way you organize your, uh, your library influences your sound, it influences Thank your you. track selection, it influences <laughs> even the flow of your sets, like something as simple as that. Uh, like I've noticed, for example, when I only did by genre, I noticed that like my mixes sometimes wouldn't have that emotion that I would want them to, just because like, you know, you're mixing and yes, you are putting like you're making art out of it, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know, like I'd find myself playing like hit the hard techno playlist and then just play tracks, you know? But when I have it set, for example, by mood, uh, or I have it set, like I have uh, recently, I've started organizing it by venue as well, because uh, oh, different venues have different sounds and stuff. Uh, and it doesn't have to be venues that I've played or I will play, like it's venues that I might want to play or it's even venues that like, like for example, um, uh, Bassiani in Georgia, like, I don't know when I'm gonna be in Georgia. I might not even play there ever in my life, but like, you know, the vibe of the club is like what I seek, you know, in the, in the making the playlist. The Bergine playlist? The Bergine playlist. Bergine playlist. <laughs> <laughs> All pop remixes, exclusively. <laughs> I feel like I wanna add, um, it's so important the way you organize your music because I literally did not start organizing like at all <laughs> until like a year yeah. ago. <laughs> Damn. And it influenced my set ball. so much because I had like thousands of songs but not organized well and it limited me so much because like you only have so much time to prepare mm -hmm. for a gig and it's like I wouldn't even have time to go through all my music. Mm -hmm. And like you said, just organizing it by genre, like it limits you so much because like you want to constantly be blending genres and making new sounds but um, yeah, doing it by mood, I feel like it's so much more like, you can get so much more creative with it um, and like make stuff that you wouldn't expect for you to even be able to make. Um, yeah, I think it's really important. I want to hop off of that because I also think it's very important to be organized with your sound. Um, like not only do it by genre, but I also do it like playlist, venue, however it works for you. But I also want to like emphasize the importance of having more than one USB <laughs> <laughs> um, for various reasons. Um, what has worked for me, um, and what I will keep on doing until I find something better, is I'll like keep one USB where it's like my main event USB. Like this is the one I'm using for the booking, the gig, right? And it has my playlist, however I've curated it, and then maybe some accompanying songs and playlists around there that I could maybe use in case it's a backup, because we all need backups. And then there will be the second USB that has like all of my stuff and you know I can rely on that. And so maybe if you <laughs> consider having more than like even two USBs or maybe like a just several that have like a good collection of your music, I feel like that will also help, you know, um, just like not hinder your growth as a DJ. Preparing a set, I feel it's like an art. You have to like think about it this yeah. way. There's reasons why people made mis mixtapes for their lovers back in the day, come on. So it's like, you wanna make sure it's intentional. Preparing a set can be uh, very technical, it can be very personal. Um, for most people, it's just like, let me find music that I've been vibing with lately and see if this will work. <laughs> so I mean, whatever floats your boat. I, I've, I've found that like, don't take it too seriously, but also take it seriously, find a balance, if that makes sense. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I feel like after listening to how everybody sets their playlist, there's, there's no wrong way to do it. It's how you feel, what you think it's right, how you're going to be able to find your music. There's always a new way to do that. Um, so I feel like the way I process a set that I have, it depends. I have to do my research with the event, with the event planner that's reaching out to me. I go through their page. I see, okay, this is what they like to listen to. And then I start going through my playlist. I go through old playlists by venues, I have them by moods. I used to hate putting it, like having playlists, and now I have way too many that it's a hot mess. <laughs> like, I don't know where to go. I'm like, I have them both, then I have uh, from Mama Tried, and I'm like, but what did I play that day? And then, you know, but then you start getting like in tune with what you want to play, you want to put it together. And then another thing I want to uh, say is that depending on your set, like how many hours you're playing, like if you're going to play for an hour, have like a three hour uh, playlist set ready because you just never know, it's never gonna go the right way. You are gonna be open-minded that day, you're like, oh my God, I can totally mix this in and instead of mixing that, what I had. So that's also my advice to always have more music than what you're expected to play. Period, I love that, great, great, <laughs> great answers. <laughs> okay, so this question is for Baphomet, um, SDRV, Eileen, and myself. 
Um, what is your advice to per curating bookings? How do you get your first booking? How do you get booked locally? How do you get booked out of state? How do I get booked for my favorite party series, radio station festival? So this is a big booking question. So if you have um, experience being booked uh, out of state or locally or internationally, like definitely talk about this. Uh, actually, this is I love this question so much uh, because it's something that I was like I, I, I it was a question that I had when I was starting out, but I didn't have anyone to ask it to, so I just would constantly just be in the dark, and I feel like a lot of upcoming DJs go through that, which is very unfortunate because in the nightlife industry, people want to take advantage of you, and they are going to take advantage of you as an artist, and if you don't know better, then you know you're gonna end up getting the short end of the stick most of the time. But my advice for procuring bookings, uh, especially the first booking, is be a part of the community. Like, go to the events, meet people. Don't go just to talk to someone because they're the organizer and, or like hound the DJ and be like, oh my God, like you're the DJ and stuff. Like, uh, like, like uh, I was saying to Mr. Bitch outside, treat people like people, you know, and be a part of the community. And eventually, like, you're gonna meet a lot of people. Uh, people are going to know you're a DJ. Eventually, someone's going to be doing an event. Maybe they talk to you the night before, and they're like, oh, maybe I should book them. And that's how you, you know, eventually you fall into this chain, and then you've got your first booking. And then from then on, so, like, people have seen that you DJ. They've seen that you do a gig. They might have liked the set, and then they're going to book you more. And it just sort of dominoes out. Um, that's for locally. Internationally or out of state is a bit more difficult because, like, here you could just go to the party and be there physically, but like if you want to get booked in like New York or something, you can't really like fly to New York and then just spend time there like in a safari looking for a gig. Um, but you also have to be part of the community digitally, I would say. Like, I don't know, personally, I tend to just look through the scenes of different cities and like take in, like look at all the artists, look at the parties, the parties they play, look to see if there's any radio stations, really get a sense of like the culture. And as an artist, a lot of the time, you're gonna follow some of those people because you like them. And then it's like, like they're not celebrities, you know, they're, you know, it's, these are local artists, they're just in a different place. Uh, so they might follow you back and they might like your stuff. Uh, I've gotten some crazy opportunities through stuff like that. Like my gig in Romania, I didn't get it through someone that I had known in Romania while I was there. I got it through a DJ from Romania who I followed on Instagram and they followed me back. And then they DM me and they're like, hey, like, do you want to play here? Like, I really like your sound. I was like, absolutely. Um, for festivals, party, like for party series, same thing. Go to the party. Meet the organizer, you know, befriend people. Radio mixes, depends on the radio, I would say. Like, apply. Usually they have an application for radios. And for festivals, I would say is the toughest. For festivals, I think, is when you, like, really need to have a certain history within your local city like you really that that's when you need to like actually know the right people and stuff for everything else you could kind of fake it till you make it you know and just be like oh i'm a dj even if you haven't done any gigs because you know like <laughs> how are they gonna know but for festivals like you've got layers of like people looking th and like scrutinizing the lineup and like taking people on and brainstorming like there's teams that are doing this so obviously you need to put forward a very good product for that Good response. Great, 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 great response. Um, I would say, like, so uh, for me here, getting booked, like, every previous booking got me the next one. Um, and I've been just very lucky with that. I definitely think a digital presence is really huge. Putting out sets is really huge. Um, I obviously know people in New York, so what I usually do is every time I go back, I message people and say, hey, I'm gonna be in town these days. You know, are you looking for DJs? Obviously there's a way to, to, to say it without sounding desperate, but like, <laughs> I got three bookings when I got, got back to New York last time, and like, that's literally just by me DMing people and being like, love your sound, following 100%. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really challenging. I'm not even gonna lie to you, like clout plays a huge part into it. Like, oh, yeah. you know, I, I am not gonna lie about that. I think that like, had I had more followers, maybe I would've gotten certain bookings, but it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. I think that like, as you know, it's a portfolio thing. As you continue to sort of like climb this invisible ladder, like the bookings will come in. It j and then throw your own shit. 
That's a big one. I'm gonna just do my own. That's a huge one. That's a huge one. People, let me tell you something. From some of the like most top tier DJs I know in New York, they were like, "Throw your own things," because you book people, and it's sort of like a, "You're booking me again, right?" Like it's a favor kind of thing too. So I think that's that's part of it. Um, Miami is a really small community, so as you start getting book book bookings, like I think people, you see very quickly. New York is a much bigger scene, so you could get lost in the, in the stuff, and you know, people gatekeep, that's a reality of it, but, <laughs> no, seriously, it's like, oh, yeah. people gatekeep, so, but, you know, that's what I'll say. Internationally, that's one that I wanna know about, but yeah, I, I, I hear all that. Yeah, inter um, internationally, I mean, it's a bit complicated, I'd say, like, f internationally, I would say, it, uh, the, the best answer would be what you said, to have a digital presence, and also to put out mixes. I think that's the most important thing is you, as a DJ, have to actually put out mixes on SoundCloud. Um, if you're a producer as well, you actually have to put tracks because people aren't gonna hear them if you don't post them. Um, and a lot of the time, like, a lot of parties tend to scout for DJs. Um, like New York, for example, is a very big hub for like uh, inter uh, European uh, clubs will sometimes, you know, might send people over to New York or they might have business there and they'll go to the clubs uh, and they'll scout out the DJs, but they're also doing this digitally all the time, you know, like they're listening to different mixes and stuff. Uh, so a lot of the time for international, at least like they'll reach out to you. It's kind of hard to like set yourself on a very specific country or something that you want to play, but that's kind of the nature of gigs in general. It's kind of like, you can tell yourself I want to play this, and you could keep saying it until it happens, but like it might not, because you know sometimes maybe someone doesn't like you, like doesn't like your sound or something, or you know like sometimes stuff like that happens. Thank you. Um, uh, SDRV, do you want to um, go, or I mean? Okay, so I have, I can speak from experience, but I definitely agree with like everything you guys said, like putting out mixes. That's kind of how I first started getting booked because I would put out just literally just like mixes based on my mood. Um, and then I just got contacted. It's like, hey, you want to play a rave? I was like, sure. Um, but I do recommend like connecting with everyone. And like when you go out, like obviously like you can like zone out, enjoy the music. But I do think it's important to make friends and like be genuine. Just like really like listen to people. Um, listening is like super important and like just just be kind and support. Um, what else can I say? Uh, out of state, um, out of state, I've been lucky because um, internet friends has helped me like so much ever since like Gami like reached out to me with that. Um, because I feel like, yeah, I've been showing my support for a long time and it was just like, it just meant the world to me when like that happened. But um, so, that's basically how I play out of state, but I do sometimes reach out to local radios and just like mutuals that like I've m like mutuals of people that I've met already, um, and just yeah, just hang out. Um, and then I feel like if it's your calling, like if you really like like DJing and and you really like lo love this community, like things will come to you. You just have to be genuine about it. Kind of like manifesting, but. Like, I don't know, I don't want to get into that, but like, it does just be, be genuine, be genuine. Um, I think it is manifesting. You think so? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. Yeah. Oh, I have something else to add. I know it's like very hard to connect with people like digitally. Like, I know like, like that's also a big part. Um, numbers do play a big part in, in your bookings, but. I think you just have to like, I think the best contact is in person. Like, like I said, like just go out and even like email sometimes, like, you know, sometimes DMs aren't it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not gonna lie, I'm very introverted. So when I first started, it was all about digital platform. Facebook was the biggest thing before Instagram. So then, you know, you have like all these music forums and the same thing, I started to post um, my mixes on SoundCloud and I started also then sending them to like music forums that I would find online and, you know, as I made friends with local producers and local DJs that would also promote parties, um, I started connecting with them, I started sending them my mixes and it got me my first booking. It was more for exposure more than anything. 
Um, so I would say definitely communication is key uh, with the right people. Be genuine about it and, you know, give feedback as well. What you think at that party, go out also and support if the, that's what you really want to do at the same time. Um, because, you know, it's one door opening, another one opens. Um, I would say out of state is also, you know, getting to know uh, friends that are out of town, um, also getting to know DJ friends that have bookings in other states that they tell you, hey, come with, you know, let's, let's do this party together. Um, and as for radio mixes, same thing. There's applications, like he said, that you can submit. Don't feel afraid to do it. Just submit. That's what your sound is. Just do it. Somebody's going to like, like that and it'll be like, yes, I want to book that person. Um, for out of, well, I was saying like out of the country, actually it was like one of my first times this year. I played in, in Mexico and, and in Colombia uh, two months ago, yes. And you know, it's also because a friend knows another friend from, from out of state into another country and they were like, hey, you know, we're going to have this party. Um, you know, I see your friend, you know, DJs and I really like what she plays. What, just always post also on social media. Show your sounds in, in any way possible. Um, and that's how I got the booking. So definitely, digital platform. Another, another really big thing um, that I just remembered is if you're a DJ, producing helps a lot. Because you're like right. once you start producing, you're going to do a few solo releases. Then maybe you're going to have labels that want to post your tracks on their EPs. And generally, like it's going to be international labels. Um, I released like my first actual release track through a collective that I joined in Romania. And then after that, like now we're getting other opportunities. Like After that, we got um, a track on this label called Hearts Whisper from France. Uh, now we're in talks for a track from in uh, for a label in Portugal, and you know when you're making tracks and stuff and releasing them through labels in certain places, a lot of people from that place follow the label and are going to listen to you, and that's how you also gain a following in those places. And if you have a following over there, the or local organizers are going to notice, and then they they might you know you might get their attention way easier than if they just saw like a video of you DJing on Instagram. Hundred um, percent. Can I add something? To, um, I think producing is like important too if that's like what you want to do. But I know like a lot of DJs don't produce and like, but I think a good way of contributing is like also like bringing people together in in your own way or like I guess like throwing events like how you, like you do, um, just like finding your like that you could stay a DJ like you don't have to you don't need the the pressure yeah. to produce but if you want to you can, but definitely like try to um, incorporate yourself with like the community. And like, there's alternatives anyway. Like, I know I, I, I mentioned producer because like I, you know, been focusing on producing a lot. But like, as a DJ, for example, like you don't have, you can't release tracks on like EPs, but you could submit them to podcasts. You know, and if you want like a following in a certain uh, place, then you find a podcast that's there, and it's basically the same thing. Like the same effect. Amazing. Thank you. There's everyone. like DJ photographers, DJ videographers. Yeah. Like, you, there's always like yeah. DJ plus mm -hmm. something. DJ <laughs> DJ plus. DJ plus. <laughs> Um, all right, this question's for Victory and, sorry, Vibraciones and Eileen. Um, how do you curate your social media presence and brand? So, I think the most important thing to curate in your social media presence, I'm not gonna say follower account because I've seen lots of accounts that are like pretty messy with their, f like, <laughs> the brand Keep and, you know, they have a lot of. Yeah, you know, it's it doesn't matter about the followers. It really is how you uh, engage with your audience. I think the first thing that one has to think about are like aesthetics because like that's what's gonna really get you booked. It's really important to have like what you do, what you're a part of, um, some links to your mixes. Maybe if you're like a resident, like maybe some videos of you performing. Videos you perform are really actually really important. It kind of like allows people to see who you are, what your sound is like live, um, and ultimately I think also engaging with other artists on social media really, really helps uh, carry a very strong social media presence. I think posting consistently is also a really, really important thing to do, um, and it doesn't really have to be um, about like, like for example, you don't have to post every single day, but it is important to post about your gigs, what you're doing that month, maybe if you have a new mix out or a new track that's coming out with a label or something like that. Um, maybe if um, you're just like 
giving an update to your um, co community or to the people who follow you. I think it's also like just about being intentional with the things that you put out there and making sure that you are um, not putting out a front because it's important for you to like uh, have like the same digital presence that you have like in person. Like I've met a lot of people who their digital presence is like completely different from what I expected them to be in, in, in person. Like, and I'm just, you know, it's a reality check. It's like, it's, you're a human, I'm a human. We're just both artists. So it's important to be intentional and real with yourself and, and like, what you put out there is what you're going to receive. So I know a lot of artists that have certain brand aesthetics, like they're more alternative, they're more like into certain underground scenes. And then there are other people who are like a little bit more open format and like they, they play all sorts of things. And like, that's okay. Like whatever is your strong suit, whatever you wanna put out there, start to curate that. Start to like create something that's distinctive of yourself. Um, and um, just be consistent and uh, collaborate with other people um, and uh, make sure to update your bios, update like your information, like your vets, uh, because you never know who's watching. You really don't. Um, I've had lots of people contact me directly from my email that I put on my Instagram, like they go on my link tree or whatever. Um, it's, it's, you never know who's watching. So kind of make sure you put your best foot out there um, and make sure that you're um, just being consistent with your brand. But yeah, it's a lot of things. Social media is tricky, guys, but I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a practice that you can get better at, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that I have to update my, my links. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but, but you still can DM and email me. That's up to date. That's very important. Uh, definitely everything that you mentioned is important for your social media. I feel like I see now my social media as like a business portfolio or a, a DJ portfolio for me because you don't know who's watching, you don't know how they are seeing you on by post what you're putting on your stories and it's very sad to hear that it it happens all the time that you may see somebody on Instagram you think like that is the coolest person but when you meet them it's the complete opposite like be you just be who you are how you are in person present that as well on social media. I've had people all the time tell me like, hey, like, why don't you buy followers? It's all about the number. I'm like, but that's not who I am. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't do it that way. Um, if I can post mixes and send them to my friends, send them to like uh, my colleagues, I tell them, hey, can you help me repost? Reposting actually works other than posting every other day with your reels, with your story. But if you have like uh, followers that you're familiar with, tell them to just help you repost a, a mix or a mashup or something you're producing. And that's how people start to find you. Um, you know, I, I guess I've, I've been fortunate enough that I know a few people that have a big following and that's what's gotten me to get following as well and with big events as well. So yeah, so it's about more like a business portfolio on the social media side, I would say. It's, it's very important. It's a good tool to have. Absolutely, thank you. Um, this question is for uh, Steffi and myself. Where do you find your music? Okay, um, like I said earlier, I use YouTube a lot. Um, YouTube has a, the algorithm on YouTube is like different. It, like you can find a lot of vinyls on there, a lot of old tracks that are like rare kind of. I'm really like into finding music that like people haven't heard before. Um, also like, f like fun stuff, sometimes like funny stuff. Um, but I use um, SoulSeek. I don't know if you guys know SoulSeek yeah. to download. Yeah, that's what's that? Uh, what's that? What's that? I don't know. Soul, you don't know SoulSeek? Big tool. Oh, put a song, on put a song queen. Wait. <laughs> put, what is SoulSeek? Soul Seek? There's also like. What kind so, of music though? Well, SoulSeek is just Everything. to download music. It's a, like a file sharing software. Peer to peer. Kind of like LimeWire. I was about ish. to ask. Oh it, yeah. <laughs> LimeWire version <Totally> 3. <laughs> and you like, you upload files basically and other people upload files and those files anyone can just download them from there. Uh, some people actually you can set it to like if, so, if you, someone wants to download your, your files that you uploaded they have to have uploaded some themselves which is great. Yeah, it's like a file sharing yeah, software touring. so you yeah. share your files yeah. and you get files I want to mention though if you get it it's so important to also be sharing files because I had yeah. no idea the person who showed it to me did not tell me yeah. you also had to be sharing <laughs> files. And then I went to my DMs one day, and it's like a hundred comments yeah. of people like, <laughs> yeah. they get mad at you too. Me. They get mad because at you. I like, wasn't sharing, and yeah. like that's why it works because 
share, <laughs> they share. I wasn't sharing. Very important. <laughs> very important. Um, and it's very anti gatekeeping. They're like, you have to post. Like, you yeah. know, you, you have to put something that you listen to. You can't just take. That's cool. Yes. Yes, I was, so Bandcamp, that's a big one. Definitely Bandcamp. Bandcamp, you know, sometimes there's like the name your price. There's also like, it, like if you know like the artist, you could just like get their music too. Um, but, but Bandcamp too, definitely like, I recommend everyone buy on Bandcamp on Fridays. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. Um, I also use this like website called Mixes DB, which I like get a lot of music from like listening to a bunch of mixes on YouTube from different like DJs that I'm super into. Mixesdb.com. It's like a forum. A lot of like DJs in Europe use it, and you could like literally find the tam the timestamps for almost any mix. You look up the artist's name and like for example like Mama Snake, Deck Montel. You see like the timestamps. It's people that like write it, but it's like a forum for DJs that's really been really useful, and. Yeah, that's kind of what SoundCloud mixes db dot com. Yeah. Yeah, we're all gonna sign into a DM because I, I need this <laughs> other. <laughs> yes. And then just yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, like sometimes like Beatport, like it really depends like where the song, like what era the song's from, like you know. And also, SoulSeek isn't always like the end all like solution. Like depending, it depends on the genre. It depends on the label. Also, like with Beatport, but like there's a lot of times where like I won't like you just can't like a recent song. You're not gonna be able to find it. Sometimes you can. I've noticed a lot of the times on uh, SoulSeek, people will upload playlists of like crates. I haven't really used crates, so I don't know exactly how that how you know they are. But it's incredible. I don't know what that is. <laughs> crates. It's like. Um, subscription services where you pay certain like a certain amount of money every month and then they'll send you like a playlist of tracks uh, and a lot of the time it will be exclusive stuff depending on like the place sometimes they'll have like acapellas for producing they'll send you like instrumentals of stuff uh, exclusive unreleased remixes and stuff but yeah basically people will take those and then they'll upload them to SoulSeek and then everyone has access to it which is honestly awesome that's dope um, so I feel like I'm glad you kind of asked that question about like, do you pay for music? Like, I'm gonna be like real, like I don't. And it's it's about it's a no. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm a producer and I also release music and I do it for free. So there's like I think there's like it's like an ethics thing. I don't think you shouldn't pay for music, but I'm just being honest with you and telling you that I don't. But um, most of the time, like what I will do, like I'm getting a lot of my music on SoundCloud. So what I will do is um, instead of like ripping it from SoundCloud, I'll go through like the actual free download gate because then that artist will get credit for it and then the AI like picks that up and boosts it. So like if you ever are going on SoundCloud and you see it's a free download, go through the steps because it's like really helpful for that producer to get that. Um, uh, I'm, I, when I do the tutorial later, like I'm actually gonna go through all the things that I use. I don't use DJ pools, um, but like I really just stay on SoundCloud because I'm really in the remix bag. But I saw some there was like a question. Someone raising their hand. Um, I'll keep it really short and simple. I use Ableton. Um, I feel like it's the most friend. I've used Logic Pro. I've used Pro Tools. Um, I use Ableton because I find it the, to be the most friendly, but that's just n it's not a hard, fast rule. Um, I release on SoundCloud. Um, the reason why I don't release on Bandcamp or profit from that money is because I don't own the rights to it. It's the reason why I don't release on Spotify. If they were originals, I would release on Spotify and actually get royalties for that music, but... I would run into copyright infringement. I actually ran into copyright infringement on SoundCloud. Drake's team came after me, and I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> no, yeah, if you do, anytime you do a Drake remix, just pitch it up. <laughs> pitch it up, because you'll get, you'll get caught for it. So. We're going to keep questions till the end, guys, so yeah. please keep your questions in your heads. Yeah, we're, we're going to have sure a section. I'm sorry them, okay? about that. Um, we're kind of running late on time, too, so I'm just going to move a little bit more quickly. Um, next question is for all of y'all. If you identify within a marginalized group, which is all of you, I think, um, how do you navigate gatekeeping, racism, other phobias? I love this question. Does anybody want to start? I feel like this is a really, really important one because there's not a big community in Miami, obviously, and 
the communities that we already have often do get already overtaken by um, cis white people straight a lot of the time. Um, and I feel like it's really important, especially if you throw events, to like really intentionally curate spaces not for white people. And I feel like it's hard to do that mindfully because I feel like it's not something that people are like always really aware of, but I feel like really like sitting down and like knowing how to create something for the people you actually want to be there. Like, and you can think that what you're creating is for the people that you want to be there, but like you have to really think like, I think going out helps a lot too. Like if you feel like very much the minority in the space, like think like what could be done differently for me to feel more welcome here and for it to feel like, um, yeah. Also, um, DJ and as an organizer, like I feel like being really involved in whatever event you're a part of um, it's so important, like I remember especially when I first moved here, I was surprised by how many um, curators I felt like weren't really involved in the party, like the night of, like I never really saw them or anything and I feel like that's kind of a big way to miss like any racism or stuff that's happening like in the venue itself. I feel like it's so important, like if I'm throwing an event, like I really try to be so present to like be around and be really recognizable and make sure people know like I am a part of this event, like um, I'm somebody you can go to because I think a lot of times like stuff can happen and like people might not know who to go to. Like obviously you're not gonna go to the DJ who's actually playing, but you could go to the DJ who had played already, like if you could recognize them or like the organizer if you make yourself known. Um, yeah. I think it's good. Kind of a two-way street, absolutely, because like there are things that you can do to protect yourself, but there are also things that the organizer has to do to protect you. Because as an organ as a party organizer, when you're like curating these events like and getting this large gathering of people, a lot of stuff can go wrong. And I feel this is something that a lot of scenes throughout the world struggle with, and we struggle with it in Miami too, I've noticed. Um, but you have to be proactive about it. A lot of the time stuff will happen, and yes, sometimes maybe some, like the person won't say it, but sometimes stuff happens, and then, you know, like there's nothing done to, to help people, and like sometimes things that shouldn't have happened happen because of a lack of responsibility and being there as an organizer and actually, you know, surveying the situation and having people that can help people. Um, really quick, I feel like also just knowing the people as an organizer, knowing the people that work in this space, especially the security, like build a relationship with those people because you need to know if you can trust them or not. You need to know if you can go to them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, also, just like I want to say this is like sometimes your, um, I don't want to say identity cards, but like, <laughs> like your identities sometimes are like ways in which that like also you can like. I don't even want to say booked, but like, say I just want to say this, like, say it. I, I just feel like this. If you're a queer person, uh, if you're, if you're, if there's a queer event organizer, queer people want to book queer people. And so it's like being like very outward sometimes about your intentionality really helps. Like as a trans person, like for call to action, I pretty much book trans people, like all 40 trans people in Miami. <laughs> but like, do you know what I mean? It's like that, that's really important too, you know? I want to talk about the gatekeeping really quick because that shit really pisses me off. Um, like, I basically will say this also, like, I think you have to do the opposite and it's like, try to put out the intention you want, right? So like, if I'm in the room and like, I'm on like a big lineup, I, I will put, bring my people with me. I will uplift my people with me and do the opposite of that. But gatekeeping is real, I'm sorry, like Miami be like a monopoly and like, um, and then I had to ask myself this question. We had this conversation. I was like, do I even care about playing for like you have space? To ask, yeah, you have to ask yourself. <laughs> this mean, is where intentionality becomes important. Yeah. Because you have to ask yourself, do I really care about being like platformed in that X, manner? Put, insert X you know, right. venue space. And sometimes you do. Um, yeah. And sometimes you have to be real with yourself about like who's playing there, how they got there, what the sound is. Do you even play that sound? And it's like sometimes you gotta like talk yourself down from those moments. Um, but the gatekeeping be real and just know it's not about you. Like you're amazing and wonderful. Really quick, I just wanna shout out you because you're one of the 
first organizers that I talked to um, about venues who weren't so weird about it. Like when <laughs> Supernatural happened, like that's where I throw my events and that place really sadly is closed indefinitely. And we talked about it, we talked about it so much and it was so surprising for no reason because it was such a normal conversation but it was so surprising just because I feel so scared and strange bringing that up to other organizers because gatekeeping is so real, but we don't realize that it literally hurts us. Like, we're hurting right. each other. Like, yeah. we are limiting ourselves and limiting such an already limited city by not allowing other people to be doing stuff. Like, mm -hmm. but yeah, you were, like, if you want to organize stuff, like, great person to talk to. Thank you, Vivian, I appreciate you're open that. To it because you were so helpful. Offering to, like, for me to come with him to, like, do venues and stuff, like, that is so rare, but it makes yeah. the so much more fun. Yes. I love you. Yeah, give me the fucking booking contact. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all, we gotta sort of wrap this up, but anybody I else wanted wanna? I wanted, I wanted to add one more thing. I think navigating gatekeeping, like your experience is valid, and I'm so happy that you spoke about that because I think we need more spaces to talk about these things, and like I think it's also really important to talk about with other organizers and DJs what you're experiencing. Like, hey, uh, I really liked your venue the other day, like uh, for this event. Can you give me the contact? Like, don't be afraid to make those connections because it's just gonna be you against yourself at that point. Yeah. If the person doesn't want to work with you, they'll let you know. Like, the worst thing that can happen is that they don't respond. And like, here in the music industry, you're just gonna have to get used to that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you have to get used to no's, but when the yeses do come, you have to be very intentional about those yeses. So don't be afraid to talk about, you know, with other people about how they navigate gatekeeping or what happens when, you know, one venue closes and they go to another and, um, you know, just be outspoken about it and create spaces where you can have these type of discussions. So. Thank you so much. Um, we're running short on time. Does anybody have like one little tidbit they want to put on this or we'll move on to the next question? Um, just really quickly, I guess um, I'm still having a difficult time like understanding the question, but I think just surround yourself with people who you want to, that like you admire and also like that are similar to you in like your experiences. And I think like you're stronger in PAC, so if you have a gig, like bring your homies, um, and just keep like running with confidence, like keep like taking those gigs, keep like doing it, like don't stop no matter like what, and y you'll be like the example. Period, I love that. Okay, um, this question is for all. Um, where do you feel like the Miami queer scene is headed and how do you feel about it now? Oof, this is so loaded. <laughs> this is so, so deep. <laughs> it's so loaded. <laughs> Do I go first? I guess I can, I can go first. Um, I, I want to be optimistic, and I mean I am. And like I don't think stuff's bad. I think it's doing great. I think we have, we have more DJs than ever, and there's more DJs that are popping up every couple of weeks, like I'll see someone new, which is incredible. And the, the scene is growing. We're, getting, we're gaining recognition. Domasol is getting featured on Miami New Times, you know, like different articles are being written about the scene. Like this stuff is being immortalized in history, basically. Um, so yeah, like I, I think it's on an upward trend, but I do have a bit of, I don't know, remorse, I guess, or I just, I feel a bit sad about the state of like real estate in Miami and the gentrification that's happening because as a scene we're doing incredible and we're growing and we're making these incredible experiences and all these incredible people are being platformed. But meanwhile, like in our backyard, like the political climate is absolutely horrendous. Trash, places are closing Trash. down left and right, you know, like we're, venues are dying out, parties are dying out. So I don't know, I guess we'll see where, where it goes because we're doing good, it's just, the other stuff that might end up crossing into our way at one point. I believe this is the peak of it right now, what's happening in the queer scene, and especially in Miami. It was already growing in other cities, even in the UK and New York, and to be brought down here, it's amazing. And you know, thank you for putting a community together, a party, and to you, Sam, like 
this is this is really growing and I appreciate the audience that goes to these events because where I came from, I started either at a straight event, either gay event, or it's a lesbian event. You have to pick which one you want to go to. It's like, why can't we just all be together? I, you know, I mean, let's be respectful at the same time, but let's all be together. What's wrong with that? And, and like you said as well, you know, it's it's making it hard also with the real estate, but as long as we keep working together and with this last question that you had, it's it's not always gonna be about the venue you wanted to book because they can have some shitty employees that they don't care about you. So we just need to come together and keep pushing and that's what I'm seeing and, and it's headed it's headed to in a good way. Who's buying the venue space is the question. <laughs> right? Because I'm tired of this I've shit. I've been thinking about that too. I'm like, can we like put some money together and like get something? There are a lot of great initiatives out there that are like trying like for example I know Masisi is buying a venue space and they're renting Period. it out and they're they're doing a fundraiser party. There are spaces out there. I think what's important is learning how to support these spaces. So if you have like a collective or a party series that's queer, trans based, uh, just focuses on a community that you feel is uh, marginalized, it's really important to support these people. Like w at the end of the day, what you're gonna do is you're gonna put money straight to our organize organizer's pocket that's gonna help them support not only themselves but the queer scene or the music scene, however you wanna put it. Like, like for example, Miami Community Radio. I can't even start. Like they started so small. It was just like a huge like idea from like a couple of handful of people, and like they just performed at Three Points. They had their own stage. Those things don't just happen. They add up. They're little small building steps. They're foundations toward a bigger dream. I think it's also important to just support um, not only the scene, but uh, just uh, don't support venues that don't support the scene. Like right. there are really shitty venues out there. Like a lot of shitty venues. So don't. Don't put your money um, in places where you wouldn't want um, your money to be. And I guess just uh, be very intentional. That's that's kind of like the biggest lesson I've learned, just to be super intentional about where you put your time, money, and energy. So. And stop asking for a guest list for every party. <laughs> stop it! I stop can't. it! We can't afford like, to. No, I get it too. Like we're all we're all you know part of a marginalized community. So obviously we all have financial hardships. But like you know like if you can make an effort, make an effort. If not, if if it really is you know like you can't. Yes, obviously make use of the resources. But do try to like support people because yeah. it's no good if like you sell fifty tickets and you have two hundred guest lists. We're paying artists. Yeah. We're paying artists to perform. And you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, some sometimes we're just doing our best to put on a good show. Um and these shows matter. They 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 um they are really important for our community. They're super cathartic, they're a huge release. I've seen so many transcendental things happening on the dance floor and that's why it's so important to uh continue supporting this, especially with uh uh queer, brown, black, uh um indigenous folks. It's really important to support these types of um communities. So Amazing thing. Yeah. Yes. Saturn, Saturn. Shout out to Saturn. Yeah. So Could not be here tonight, yeah. unfortunately. Saturn was supposed to be here, unfortunately. She got sick, but yes. Shout out to Saturn. Thank she you to Baphomet for yes. uh, being here Thanks in her honor and her place. Period. Um, honestly, putting on such good input for this panel. I'm yeah, like living for it. Um, I'm going to say one tidbit and then we're going to move on, but just like I'm really hopeful for where it's going. Mm -hmm. I'm very hopeful about where the queer, especially coming from like the epicenter of queerness in New York, you know, it's like this queer community is really special because everybody will show out and I love that. Like the loyalty is deep. Like Lion King, Simba, Mufasa deep, you right. know? Yeah, Period. get it. Um, okay, we have about like five questions left so we're gonna move quickly. Um, this question's for uh, Baphomet, Steffi, Eileen, Mr. Bitch, Miss Purple, I mean pretty much all of us. <laughs> all, of us. Visit. <laughs> all of us. Um, but just keep question, keep the answers pretty concise. Um, how do you figure out your rate and how do you negotiate? This is such an important ass question. Um, I like to do my research on who's booking me. If it's a, a smaller like local venue that uh, like that I can like perceive that like they're just you know like doing this like like they're volunteer like there's a lot of volunteers or they're smaller like I, I would lower my rate. But um, if it's something if it's someone like space or like a bigger festival, like, I'll definitely, like, keep it as high as I can. <laughs> um, and how do I negotiate? Um, 
I'm like, I tend to just like, like honestly, I, te I tend to just take what I can at this point. <laughs> but like, I, I try to negotiate, you know? Like, <laughs> start no. high. Start I guess start high, yeah. Like add $100 to whatever you said. And also, it's very important to like, yeah, like, ask the organizer how much they're paying you. Ask them the terms. Ask them how long you're playing for, whether, like, how much they're going to pay you if you get drink tickets, what guest list spots you have, because most of the time, they're not going to tell you. Like, they don't really care about your experience a lot of the time. I, as in it, like, international DJs, like the, the ones that are constantly touring, yes, they get pampered, and they have a technical writer and stuff, but for the local DJs, like, you're just the local DJ, so they're not going to you know, try to make you very comfortable. So you're gonna have to ask for it yourself because a lot of the time, like I've done gigs where like, we didn't talk about payment even after the gig and I played like two hours over because they asked me to because they needed me to cover. And then I got paid like $35 two weeks later. Hell oh my God. You know, you have to say yeah, that. Yeah, do not, do not confirm a booking without saying what is the pay rate and for how long and what slot am I in. If you are headlining, you should be, be getting paid very well. Obviously, it depends on who the event organizer is, but the counter question is, what's the budget? Yes. What's the rate? What's the budget? And then you just kind of go back and forth. But, like, also, obviously, if it's your friend, you know. Be, You've got to be, be flexible. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I'm just talking yeah. about situations that you're like, mm. like that, you know? But Yeah, like, sometimes you'll do favors. I don't know. And, like, I'm... I, uh, I've had people tell me like, oh my God, don't do that. Don't play for free or like whatever. But like for like friends or like for a party that I really believe in, that I really like, yes, you know, like I might do it because it's not about the money for me. Like, right, absolutely. Let's, can we talk about playing for free really quickly? Very quickly. Because like, you know, you start off playing for free. That There's nothing wrong with that, guys. I think it's okay to play for free. But once you start growing in your like DJ career, your artist career, there comes a point where you have to honor your time and your energy and be like, set a set rate. Um, because you can't keep playing for free, especially if it's like a paid venue where there's doing like ticketing events. So um, when you're starting off, it's good. Like if you have like word of mouth, if your friends are like, yeah, this is so, so DJs, let me get them for a house party or whatever. That's a good way to network. You never know, again, who is watching or who is listening. But as you grow into it, um, learn how to set a rate. Learn how to be like, no, I don't play for free. This is my rate. Let's talk about it. You know, it's, it's OK. It's OK. <laughs> it hurts at first, though. I, I want to say, no, I'm dead. Oh. <laughs> I want to say um, about playing for free, because I agree with that so much. And I got to a point like a couple months ago where I told myself I wouldn't play for free anymore. But then like immediately after that, there was a situation where somebody was just growing their first event. And I feel like, and it was a friend. And I feel like it's really important to focus on individual events, because like right when I started DJing, I got a corporate gig. I didn't know anything. I was just playing out of my ass, like finding out new buttons at the gig. <laughs> but I charged them like 400 bucks because I knew they had that money. And now, as somebody who's really experienced, like I would still, I would still do something for free if I felt like they truly appreciated me and I felt like I truly could like make the energy for that and that they genuinely needed it. Like know these people, like you said, like know these organizers, know that they're not bullshitting you. But like if you think, if you can tell somebody's really throwing this event with like all their own money, like, you know, it does go a long way to help, even if you're at a point in your career where you wouldn't do something for free. Um, I think it, it definitely depends. Um, yeah. And I feel like, as somebody who throws events, like, completely out of my own pocket, I feel like it has benefited. I've been so lucky to, especially my first event, have people just, like, who were so experienced still want to help out so much. Like, I would not have been able to throw a second event even because I would have lost so much money because I wanted good people on the lineup. I wanted people I trusted. But obviously, throwing an event by yourself is a lot of money. Um, so I feel like it's once again about also being really intentional and letting these people know because I feel like people are going to be less likely to want to help you if they can't really tell what your intentions are. Like, you have to be really clear about, like, why you want to help, how you want to help, and, um, yeah, just try not to be greedy. <laughs> Absolutely. Also, I've figured out my rate from booking people. I've <laughs> been like, oh, you're that much? Okay, I can go somewhere around that. Okay. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's like a really uncomfortable conversation. Um, and it's like, because you're putting a number to like your labor, but it's just the reality of the situation. So 
whenever I have to ask an organizer if they're gonna pay me or how much, I like I, I have this gut feeling that like if I ask them, they're gonna hate me and want me to die. <laughs> like it's the day. <laughs> but I mean, you have to, you know. Yeah. Especially if it's a friend, I feel like it's so important to like oh create that boundary because oh. like you said, people will try to take advantage of you, and people that I know will just like expect a cheap ass booking fee for like two hours or like free even and it's like you have to create that boundary of like we might know each other we may have like a great relationship but like those this gotta is get paid so much time and effort those and that's get paid. Also, that's <laughs> yeah like it's you have to be able to like i feel like see through a lot and not be uncomfortable like as somebody who's also so scared of confrontation like you have to not or you'll get fucked over so many times as i have because i wasn't confrontational but you just need to for yourself, like to respect yourself. Period. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to the next question. Um, this is also a question for everybody, but again, uh, the answer is concise. With the rise of social media, we have seen more performative DJs such as Horse Girl, Uncle Waffles, and this led, this has led to discussion regarding technical ab ability, performance, and respect for the art form. What do you feel like is important on the dance floor? Different strokes for different folks, to be honest. Like, I mean, obviously, everyone's going to have an opinion on this, and I have an opinion on this, like the perf DJs who are there as performers and stuff. I don't think it's bad. I mean, you know, like Patrick Mason, for example, like, he's DJing, yeah. and he's also dancing, okay. which is nice. But he's know? doing but it. But he's, he's, <laughs> he's doing it, yeah. <laughs> he's, like, he's like a full performance. Yeah, like, exactly. It's, and is he DJing? It's <laughs> art, actually. Um, because she gets in front of the decks and actually dances, right. where that's not something that's necessarily included in your performances. I mean, I guess if you're in front or back. I'm not saying that she's not a DJ because she's performing. I'm just saying there's a performative element now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, oh, no, Uncle Waffles, no, like, sir, like, serves all these class. people. Well, I also think Horse Girl serves as well, but I do think there is a character. I mean, that's like an extreme version, right? Because like, she's wearing a mask while she's performing. It's a performance, like, and it's there's like, marketing around it too. So it's like the question really is here because like DJing was such a technical skill. If you go back to like hip hop and scratching, like no one's wearing a damn mask. But now it's different, you know. So it's like, is it technical ability? Like, how do y'all feel? Like, really the question it's art it's all it's art it's all it's art, art I think. yeah because if Vibes. it depends the audience how you build your audience so you want them to see you as an artist and also curate music in between or do you just want to be on the vinyls or on the cdj's just glued and djing but you're having an amazing set like i think it's fun to see you know uh for me sometimes i can be very gimmicky and i like to dance i used to not dance when i used to dj but i'm not really looking for just to come see me DJ. That's like, an, that's an art, that's what I see. I think at the end of the day also, it's like, it's more about whether their, like their art is more about the performance or the music. For me, I think that's where I draw the line because for example, like I like Horse Girl, you know, like it's cute, it's playful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like she's a horse. I, I she think dresses it's as interesting. a horse. I don't know how she does it. I'm yeah. just gonna say it's so it. fucking cool. I'm sorry. Yeah. If the music really cool. sounds good, you get hot under there. Let me just be honest. I, you try I, DJ with a damn mask yeah, on. You it's a that. horse yeah. mask. I'd like to see you try. Like, like <laughs> props for the effort. The effort. Can't even props. see. Okay, okay, but Mattia was saying. <laughs> so sorry. We didn't mean to like. Okay. No, no, no. It's okay. Uh, but yeah, like it's. I think it's. It's, it's, it's to me at least. It's always at the end of the day going to be about the music i like you know performances so like if if it's a performer and the music is good i'll like them but if they're just performing just for the sake of like performing at that point like become an actor or you know something else i'm sorry but like um yeah like just yeah <laughs> i think it's also about energy like it's about to me music and energy more than anything because i've heard some like in my opinion, bad sets, just because I didn't vibe with the music personally. Like, I know other people vibe with it, but it wasn't my kind of music, but just because of the energy of the DJ, I vibed with them. Like, I think 
it's just about the energy you're giving out. And I realized that like really soon into DJing, like when I would be in my own head so much, I'd look up and like people weren't vibing that much because I wasn't present and I wasn't connecting with them. But when you're connecting with them, like no matter what you're playing, like it could be somebody's complete opposite type of music that they're into, but like connect with them and be really intentional about what you're playing also because it'll show. Like what I play, I'm trying to create a really distinct feeling between me and the crowd and I think whether I'm dancing a lot or just like huddled in my corner, um, the feeling that you're trying to make will be shown and I think that is more important than technical ability or anything because everybody's gonna have an opinion. Everybody has a different style of DJing but um, I think if the energy is right, um, I, think th I think that's the most important thing. Aww. <laughs> that was very sweet. Um, I'm like, like on a personal standpoint, I'm really like big on like technical ability because you are there for the music, but you also are put on a sort of pedestal, like being on a stage, providing the whole entire like mood for the night. So there is some like physical aspect to it. I prefer, uh, if I was like in a corner, just like playing my favorite tracks, like mask on, like I would love to do that. But um, there is like a sort of like, like act that you have to put on in, like, and you have to like put on the confidence to perform because you are performing and people are there and there's a lot of people. And <laughs> but it's all the music so, and the energy that you provide, which is very important. So it's a mix of both. The technical Period. ability is big. Yeah. I want to bounce off of Steffi because I also believe technical ability is important, but I don't know. That's just, I feel like some DJs don't find that important. That's okay. I feel like artistry is really a personal thing. So going back to like the question, what do you feel is most important on the dance floor? I think it's like, um, okay, what's most important is how I want to make people feel. I feel, I feel like that's what I try to, to, to put forward with with sets, it's like, how do I want to make people feel? And so when you, when you really set a question for yourself, you can really find a lot of open-ended solutions. And you know, who cares if they put on a mask? That's, that's their thing. Like maybe you like are really good at something else and you can like use that as your talent. Everybody's different. Um, and it's really important to find yourself like a distinguishing factor within yourself that makes you unique that you can also implement into your sets. Like, I, I could uh, go down the roll and let you know every single person in this panel like why I find them unique, but I don't think I have to do that because like we all know what makes us unique. So y just try to highlight that. And if you don't know what makes you unique, then that's where you should start. Mm -hmm. That's where you should start. Great, great answer. Really, really quickly, yep. um, what you were saying about like being in a like ideally in a corner like that was my immediate thought. So many of my first sets because I felt like. Yeah, sometimes I didn't want to feel performative, and sometimes I would get drunk just to be performative. And it's like, it's like that post that went out a while ago that was like, why you should stop facing the DJ booth? Because oh, like, okay. we used to not do that, but like, realistically, in our culture today, like, that's not just going to magically happen. Like, we're not just going to magically start facing the speakers, which are oftentimes right in front of the DJ. Um, and that's why I feel like it's important to like, yeah, understand, like you said, that there is a performative aspect no matter what, because like nine times out of ten, the DJ is going to be on a platform you are the center of the party, so it's like, the technical is so, so important, but you also have to be aware of like, yeah, what energy am I giving out to this event right now? How am I making these people feel? Which, in my experience, I feel like if you're 100% focused on the technical, you can't be focused on that, so it's like trying to find that balance yeah. between the energy you're giving out and also, obviously, playing a clean, fun set. Love that, love that. Um, okay, this question is for Vibraciones, Ms. Purple Shampoo, and myself. How do you, as both DJ and event organizer, prioritize harm reduction and maintain an intentional space? I'm gonna just start yeah. with this because um, I, I, I think that the quote is always used a lot. This, this term I see thrown around a lot about party spaces being a safe space. Um, party spaces are not inherently safe. We have drugs, alcohol, queer people with trauma, the X over here, and then like, you know, it's just like, I think safer space is the term that I like to use personally, and I think there's ways to intentionally make that. Um, I think you and I spoke about this, but like, or maybe me and Luna's, like making a space for folks, like, I don't know, I get really stimulated at parties, 
it would be nice to make like a little pocket where people could go decompress. Like a little like. They, I've heard of that. Um, is that a lot that of, exists, right? I, yeah, I've heard a lot about like event organizers creating like spaces where maybe it's like an outdoor space or like a stimming space with, you know, for neurodiverse folks. And it's been like really successful because like party goers were also different, right? And you know, we go there for a specific sound, for a specific artist maybe. So I think uh, kind of like thinking about what, how you should uh, bring more accessibility to your community. Like, for example, for me, I think it's really important to uh, create harm reduction in terms of like, if you know people are gonna do drugs and make sure that you have something to like fight Narcan. that. Or like, you know, yeah. so I always bring Narcan to my events. Like, I have like crap ton of boxes of Narcan. And like, if you have some to give away, give it to organizers, let them know where they can find free Narcan. Um, learn how to administer Narcan and make sure you call the, um, the ambulance at least within the next hour. So it's just knowing the steps, knowing harm reduction, and I think also uh, just creating intentional spaces. Again, here we go with intentional spaces. And I'm going to like really put this into people's heads because I think that's like really what it comes down to it. Um, and um, I feel like also it's really important to uh, think about the type of people that are coming to your events and yeah. how you can serve these folks a little bit better. Um, so, you know, if you could provide headphones or like little earplugs or maybe like, like for the first uh, event that Funraver did, it was like a sex positive event. So we provided uh, like condoms and pregnancy strips and plan B and, you know, it's just a way of uh, thinking about your, your, your audience, thinking about what they would need, thinking about like how they're going to act before and post the party. Um, because these are the people who are gonna keep on coming back to your events and keep on supporting you. And it's important to keep them safe. Like think of them as your friends, think of them as your partner or as your, as your siblings. Like, like at the end of the day, y'all are sharing a dance floor together. That's sacred, you know what I mean? So it's um, just, just think about how you can um, serve these people. Also, if you know that something, like an, a venue is wheelchair accessible, put it on your flyer. Absolutely. Put it on your description. Gender neutral bathrooms. Because that stops people from coming to events. And like I know so many amazing ravers that are like in wheelchairs, and that's okay. Like They just want to come and fucking party, but they don't know that they can because like the venue doesn't say that it can. But yeah, that's my two cents. Um, I also want to just piggyback off of that and say that I used to use this concept called vibe checkers in New York because mm -hmm. the parties were bigger. Um, it's just like not security, but folks that are just like checking in and seeing like, yeah, if, if everybody's okay, like if someone's like, looks like they're about to fall asleep or like um, just also like, and consent is another big piece I wanted to talk about too. It's not sexy, it's mandatory. You know, like I, I really like believe hard and firm about that and like Vibe checkers are a great idea for that, or just you know having eyes around um, the space. I wanted to also add, like we're just bouncing off each other. Like, uh, so I do this concept called Guardian Angels at my events for fundraiser, where I like get people that I trust specifically, just like if it's security or people who are working door, even just friends that I'm having guest lists, I'll just ask them, hey, like. Um, can you just like keep an eye on the crowd while I'm DJing or while this person's up? Like, you know, I'm just, like just super busy. And that really, really helps when you build like a community of people that you can trust that keep on coming to your events. And like in return, you can help them with their events. And uh, Guardian Angels is, is, is like, they just essentially are meant to help keep the crowd safe. Because, um, you know, you want to have eyes making sure that everybody's okay um, and not like doing things that are like really dumb and nobody's there to help them. So, I mean, there's no dumb thing. People just make decisions that, you know, sometimes we disagree with and like, you know, it's not the safest decision, but like you have to be prepared to, 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 to like work with that and you have to be prepared to remedy that in the case that things do go wrong. Luckily, things have not gone wrong. And I think that's because we put such precaution, precaution, um, precaution, I can't say this word, but we put precaution. precaution. Thank you, we put precaution into our events. So um, I feel like that's what's made things really helpful. And uh, just like, you know, being, being on the same terms with everybody and getting good security. Getting good security helps. Do you want to add anything to that? Going off what you said about um, like how club spaces are inherently not safe, I feel like it's so vital to be aware of that because obviously as an event organizer you want to like have a lovely idea of your events being safe spaces but like that is so damaging and like I have gone to events and never gone again because they promote as such safe spaces and act as though there is this magical haven at their place where nothing bad can happen and bad stuff always happens to happen there and I think <laughs> it's because 
they are so ignorant about it and so backwards because by being like, oh, this is a safe space, it's a safe space, safe space, safe space, you're not gonna be talking about shit that happened there that isn't safe because you wanna not project that image, but that's so silly because like, be real, like be real, please. Like I think having that awareness that like no matter how much work can go into creating a safe space, like nowhere is entirely safe. And to say that is really much more damaging than it is helpful. Um, and when it comes to intentional spaces, really quick, I feel like it's so important to do something that is so true to you. Like I throw disco events because that is like my childhood, like I said, like that is like me healing my inner child. Like that is my truest, purest form of enjoyment. And I, that's what I strive to recreate. Like I know exactly what I'm trying to create and I feel like it's really easy, especially as a DJ or just somebody who wants to do stuff um, in the scene, it's really easy to just want to throw an event together without really a clear intention, and that is where the things go so wrong because you're only going to care so much about it depending on how much it is like true to you. Um, so I feel like it's so important to do something that like really, really means like the world to you and like really soothes your soul truly. Um, yeah. I love that. Thank you. What you said about um, about clubs like posing as safe spaces and not really being is something that I think we should be talking about a lot more. And this is something that we as performers and organizers know better than like the people that go to parties because we interact with the people that run the clubs. But also another big thing that I've noticed is it's, I don't want to say trendy, but everyone always puts rules where it's like no homophobia, no racism, no sexism. And like there have been so many times where I've met the organizer of one of those parties and they'll put that up and like, they're like the most racist person you've ever met. <laughs> or like they make some crazy jokes and st like, you know, and they're like, it's so weird. And like, I think we really need to talk about it and we need to call people out for stuff like this because a lot of the time, like even at a party, they might say something and then everyone's just like quiet and like they just pretend they didn't hear it, which like is very harmful. And that's why it's so much more important, sorry, to be, like I said, aware, like rather than just posting shit, like, yes. because that be accountable. isn't even real. It's not even real. Like that, a post before the event saying no racism, no homophobia, no yeah. transphobia, like, that doesn't don't mean shit. Like, <laughs> don't fight, guys. Don't fight yeah. each other. I think people need to be more realistic. I think being accountable is what we're talking about. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's really like holding yourself accountable as an event organizer, knowing that shit's gonna happen, and being able to talk about it and know that it doesn't make you a bad person. Um, okay, we've got two more questions Before left. we move on to the next question, I just really wanna shout out Decrim305. Uh, they provide free Narcan for events. If you guys are ever needing free Narcan. Uh, and um, Florida Access Network, which provides free Plan B. So please get in touch with them if you ever need that stuff for your events. Okay, yeah, I'm done. Um, what are your, so this is for Baphomet, uh, Vibraciones, and myself. What are your pro tips for networking? <laughs> the biggest thing and this is something that I still struggle with, is don't force yourself to go out to network. This is something that a lot of people struggle with, I know, is like going out every single weekend just because you have to be there. Because, I mean, it is true that you do lose relevance if you like don't go out as often. But you can't burn yourself out because you're gonna go out and you're gonna be standing there and you're gonna be like, I don't wanna be here, I don't wanna talk to anyone, and you're gonna have to like force yourself through conversations and that's when it starts to not become fun anymore. And that's really where a lot of people like sometimes end up like, quitting or like stop going to parties. So don't force yourself and be natural. Very big thing. Don't put up a facade. Don't pretend to be someone. Don't treat people like they're gods. Everyone is a person. Even that crazy like 300,000 follower DJ that you see is going from like Ibiza to like South America. Like they're still a person. And like sometimes those people are boring as hell. Or you know like it just usually don't are. Or sometimes they're just like terrible people. That, that happens right. sometimes with artists. You'll be like, wow, their, their art is so good. They're so cool. <laughs> you're like, wow, I really like this artist and I feel so inspired by them. And then you meet them and you're like, God, this is the most insufferable person I've ever met. Don't idolize people. Right, 100%. No, it, It's just gonna lead to disappointment. Just admire qualities in them and try to build that within yourself. Yeah, the clout chasing, don't do it because it, it will, they'll sniff it right out too. Cause like you think you're the only one. A lot of people are obviously <laughs> trying to climb that ladder. Um, and just also, I feel like you brought up a really good point. Like sometimes when you start commodifying your skill, 
you start to like lose the fun out of it and it's like am I even partying anymore even am, am I having a good time because now I usually this is my workspace so it's like really being able to separate work and actually having a good time it's not always about networking it's not always about making that plug you know I struggle with that team can we move to the next question or do you have anything else to say okay cool um, last question, and then we'll move to QA. Um, how do we uplift each other as DJs? How do we create camaraderie instead of competition? This one is just like, I love this question. So good. So much. So it's so good. It, it I like think you should give everyone a hug. Goes into <laughs> Definitely. Let's just, let's just <laughs> hug each other. Right? Let's <laughs> hug each other. But that ass, um, I feel like it is so big to be like motherfucking mysterious and be cool and nonchalant and I don't give a fuck. Like I hate that more than anything in the scene yes. because that is not, we are already so tiny. We already have the world against us. Like we need to be as loving as we can be in that moment to, towards each other because it helps each other. It helps us more than it negatively affects us. Um, and I hear so much discourse about, oh my God, there's too many DJs now. But a boop boop. I feel like that is so stupid because like there is Said more who? than enough room. <laughs> Said who? <laughs> so many people. I like people I talk to every time I go out act like because there are new DJs every week. But that is so beautiful, and I think if anything, it pushes us so much further creatively because there is competition and. I feel like within myself even, like as soon as I started DJing, I could tell how many new people were coming out month after month and it only inspired me to do something distinct and to be more creative and to make myself known for what I do. And by doing that, we create so many um, possible people to book that have such unique sounds rather than just like be mad about it. And I also really believe in like, karma and stuff, not to get into all that, but I think if like the energy that you have is like being mad that like there's other people doing stuff that you want to be doing or that there's too many people, blah, 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 I really don't think that's going to help you in any possible way. I think we need to be focusing on how much it can benefit us from having more people um, and like just supporting in real ways also, like supporting each other in real ways, like don't show up to places just only if you're playing like go take a video of somebody playing, like go say their names in rooms where you think it's important for them to be known, like, yeah. Supporting each other in real ways, because you can also just like say shit online and like and blah, 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 but I think like really, truly finding artists that you care about and really doing what you can to push them up, because it like, like I said, it only benefits us, um, yeah. I mean, nobody here has made me feel like this is a competition, and I feel that's awesome, like, we're just all supportive. And the only time you should feel like there's a competition, just try a DJ battle. That's the only time you should ah, feel that yeah. way, okay? But other than that is support each other. Be genuine also, you know? Be real that you want to comment on how that set was, how their, what their picture is, or supporting their events. Just be genuine about it at the end of the day. And that goes a long way. No reason to feel like it's, it's competitive, honestly. Um, sometimes I've made a lot of assumptions in my head about competition with, with people and I, I can just say that like, like, just throw it away. It's not real. It's something you're making up in your head and um, you're really your own competition. Like, no one sounds like you. You're special in your own way. Yeah, and like, uh, you know, thinking it's a competition, I mean, I know a lot of us fall into it like it's normal, but at the same time, it's like, competition for what? Like, what are you trying to win? Yeah, what's the goal? You know, <laughs> we're always like, oh my God, like, you know, like you, you, you start feeling stuff like this, but once you start to rationalize it, you're like, why? Like, what? Like, is there a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? And like, I have to get there first. It's a boiler room set. <laughs> it's a boiler room set. <laughs> That's true, actually. But even then, boiler room sets are all about like who you know and who you get to network with. So it's important to be nice to people. It's important to right, like but connect then, with and DJs. And also like a boiler room, if you don't have a boiler room set, it doesn't mean you're not a good DJ. Like I had to tell myself exactly. that so many times. Exactly. I think that's a big reason people create competition in their heads because they think they need to like get to some point without realizing that like that might not even do anything for them. Like right. what you were saying earlier, like think about really what, why you want something and like what it'll do for you and like if you know it's even worth having yeah. fucking negative energy over. Sure, there's more bookings that will come in, but like are you happy with ha what you're doing? Like you know, what is the why? Exactly. So, okay. 
Um, can we move on to Q&A? We'll, we're gonna do like one or two questions because like we're super over time. Thank you. Thank you. It was amazing. Um, CC, another one that's amazing from the point of Period. view. Period. Um, but I think there needs to be more that's done. I mean, just looking at this panel, like I said, you guys are all amazing, but there's nobody on this panel that is like visibly black and queer. And that is something that's important. There's that voice out of the six voices on this panel. There should be at least one that everybody can look at. It's somebody that looks like me, somebody that looks like you, somebody that looks like any black person in this room can look at and be like, oh, that's my brother, that's my sister. They're, um, they're coming up the same way that I come up. So I think that that's something that a lot of DJs in Miami really need to kind of like focus in on. And I think part of that is playing music that really brings in black people. And that's not to say that your music is not what, play, play what you want to play kind of thing. But also understand that the history of DJing and the roots of DJing comes from hip hop. Do some research on some hip hop. Don't just play Ice Spice and Sexy Red and Drake. Play some, Hip hop that nobody's heard. Like look, look deep into the into the history of hip hop and look into things that you're gonna see. Um, I went to um, one of Saturn's parties at the. Um, it was the, it was the after party for Space. Um, I forgot what the DJ's name was, but she played. Are you Jotley. Uh, what? Jotley, you're talking about Jotley yeah, and Skrillex. Yes, uh, she played right down somebody by Leah, and the whole club was singing. And that's because hip hop has been one of the best selling music for the past 20 years since its inception, and so. People connect to hip hop. People really feel hip hop, and especially black people. That's our music. And so, understanding that and understanding the roots of DJing, I feel like it would be very beneficial to add a little hip hop in there, add something just even if it's just the beats, add something that can bring that black community, make everybody feel like, okay, this space is for me too. Now, I'm not just coming here because my friends are coming here, but this space is for me too. Absolutely. I, and also, I just appreciate your feedback in terms of the panel, because that's, that's really important to me, and I feel like we both talked about that. You know, um, Originally, we did have someone who was black on the panel, unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, I'm not saying there's not a lot of black DJs in the community. There, there are, and we, we have to prioritize them. Um, I'm somebody who plays a lot of black music in my sets. Like I play dance hall, I'm a piano. I don't really play hip hop that much, just because like it's just not my bag, like I'll be honest with you, but I understand the origins of, of DJing and I think that's a really important point that you're bringing up. Um, I mean, techno is uh, in house is also originated from black music too. So rock like, too. Rock too, I, I mean, mean yeah. basically but, all modern music honestly has yeah, originated yeah. from black music. But I, I understand what you're saying too and I think there are spaces also beyond like Masisi and what I've said um, that like, uh, Red Rooster throws uh, Groove Theory. That's like an R&B, their soul selection, um, which is like straight just on a piano. So I think uh, black music is encompass of not just hip hop, but also other genres. But I 100% I agree with what you're saying. If anybody else has anything to say, Masanda. I just Thank wanted you. to say quickly, I feel like um, that's a big reason why I started throwing um, discotheca events. Um, because I realized like, like one, it was like something true to me, but I also realized like I really didn't want to be throwing something that wasn't needed. And like there's so many new things even being thrown that aren't really needed. And I like what I was saying before also about like creating spaces, like I said, for not white people and like playing music, especially playing not the whitewashed version of disco and booking black and brown artists because I feel like, yeah, I can tell like the feedback I get is so beautiful because I can tell it's such a needed thing, like you said, because it's not what the majority of the scene is curated towards. Um, yeah. 
I think that was a really good point that you brought up, and it's also this is a, something that we haven't really touched on during the panel very much, but there is a political aspect to raving and to the music community, and there is a history to it that you need to educate yourself on. I know a lot of people tend to just kind of not really care, which is like, I, okay, I get like if history bores you, but you have to learn about it because like there are people that, there's literally people that have died for us to be able to go to these parties and to enjoy these things. And I think the least we can do to honor them is to actually learn their stories and talk about them. I want to say thank you for bringing that up. It's yeah. a very important topic. Very um, no, seriously. We, we, wanted, we wanted, we did our best to have a black panelist. We really did it in the end, it did not work. Uh, moving forward, that will be a priority. Um, there are so many parties out there that are throwing really, really good, um, like putting out such important sounds. Like um, we just had a, like a, a party solely focused, like Mr. Bitch, he does the gay agenda. We just did a party solely focused on like Jersey Club, Baltimore Club, Footwork, Booty Bounce. Um, I know other organizers who are also doing that, New York and Texas and here in Florida. Um, and like this is why we have to emphasize highlighting these parties and going to these parties and supporting these parties. But my point is that, thank you for saying that, because it, it takes a lot. It's a very uncomfortable discussion and um, it's something that's important for us to highlight. So thanks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Always. Thank you. It's Absolutely. Miami, Miami, man. Like you feel like you're so small. Like since it's so small, you feel so like, like isolated sometimes, and you like it's like very difficult to like connect sometimes because it's like there's certain sounds, there's this and there's that. But at the end of the day, the underground scene is for black and queer people, so yeah. that's why we do what we do because we love you guys and yeah. we're a part of it. Also, too. I just want to bring up a point: is this like. Um, that's why I do also like ticketing for like if you see any of my my shows like I usually do like black and trans people are always discounted and I will never turn away anybody who is like can't afford a fucking ticket because it's t rough in the streets. So yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Absolutely. Like a YouTube rip. Can we, yeah. can we save that question just for the tutorial? Because I'm going to go through that. It, it, we're going to talk but about bit rate. But you can tell from all audio quality, especially yes. if you're in a club. You can tell. You can tell oh, yeah. the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, like literally visually engineer, like and audibly. Yeah. I, I just, I've, I've seen like the sound engineers get like visibly frustrated when like they play YouTube rips because it like distorts in a way where it, like the levels just go all over the place and it's like it's quiet like you can't really so like the only way to fix that is to redline and that's like not mm -mm. what a club mm -mm. wants mm -mm. <laughs> you break the equipment people start going deaf yeah like it's no. just stuff happening you're clipping your mixes it's so just so not fun it's always just safe to download from like soulseek and other like trusted websites okay. bandcamp and buy your music buy yeah your music. always or hit up the artist <laughs> hit up your if friends you can, if you can hit up your friends your talented friends okay Last question. Or maybe not last question. Thank you so much. That's very sweet. Thanks. Is there uh, one more question, then we're going to move on to the raffle? We're good? Oh. That's a great that. question. That's a great question. Yeah, the, the the person I'm thinking of is like Chris Brown and R, R. Kelly, and like I I refuse to not separate them because they're a person. It's coming from the same source, um, and y you know, incredible artists, but like. Come on, we gotta hold people accountable. Uh, you know, 
So, I mean, that's just my two cents on that. Um, but And locally also it's a thing like when <coughs> someone is problematic, for example, it kind of sucks because like people won't call them out because like we all see each other every weekend. And then, you know, like people want to avoid uh, like causing tension or drama or stuff. But like that's, you can't really do that. I feel like we can't afford to, being such a small community, we can't afford to separate the art from the artist. Like we need to not let our scene be poisoned as we've seen it almost be poisoned so many times by people who could have been great artists, could have been cur great curators. Um, but we need to have people who are both great artists and great people um, in order to like maintain our small community and not let it go to shit. Yeah, I think that's the same to say for like local people too. Like doesn't matter what your your status is, like we should all be held accountable to the same Definitely. degree. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to the raffle at this point. First of all, the conclusion, we've, we've concluded. <laughs> Th thank you for like your wonderful questions for sitting. I know we like totally went over time, um, but just thank you for supporting um, the event. Um, if you haven't, if you want to get in the raffle, this is your moment. Anybody raise their hand if they... Okay, I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> so the raffle is a $10 entry. Um, it gets you a 64 gig USB, um, Auto-Technica headphones, um, as well as a tour device city Kava, which I would love for you to come up and talk about. Or perfect. Hey, everybody. Second. How y'all doing? Go ahead, Brian. I'm Brian. Um, I'm one of the own owners of Vice City Cava. We just opened about a month and a week ago. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everybody on the panel. Um, and uh, I have no idea how to follow you all up. So uh, to talk about yeah. the Sound Lab. So yeah. So Vice City, we just opened up. Um, basically, we're I'm the founder of Ban All Music Records. Um, and then after that, I wanted to found something that that helped the community. So I started the Sound Library. Maybe about three months ago or so, and then that eventually turned into a music venue. And um, yeah, we're open right now. There's people there and we're owner run, so it's just four of us. And um, yeah, we wanted, to give, uh, we wanted to give a raffle prize. We also do, we're gonna start an educational series this Monday, um, starting with the record, record label 10101, which is just basically like getting to know how to approach record labels, um, how to contact, them, what is the etiquette on even talking to people inside of labels? Because um, you know, a lot of artists are like, hey, I want this, I want this, I want this. But in the end of the day, um, the contact just needs to be known how to make it. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, is that. And then Tuesday, we have, let's see, we have a songwriting session, I believe. Wednesday, we're going to do music theory. Um, and these are all daytime events. We call them office hours. And so, they're just RSVP only. They're, we ask everybody that comes to buy a drink because that's how we get our money. But basically, um, for any organizer that wants to host an event in our space, we go ahead, they get all the profit. You know, They split it amongst their artists. Um, we're all artists there, so we really understand the situation and how the scene needs the, honestly, cash flow in the end of the day to go and make that happen. So all we ask in return is you know, like buy a tea or something. And that keeps us eating. And um, yeah, it's four of us. You can literally go in and have a conversation with any of us. We have music events every single night as well, from uh, an open mic on Monday to different types of, um, of events. We have a femme-led event on Thursday called Divine Feminine, um, and we're gonna be doing that every single um, Thursday. Um, let's see, actually, let me pull up my calendar. We have... So, as, um, as definitely the worst DJ in the room, um, I, uh, <laughs> I wanted to include in here a, I, I looked at the, um, I looked, I was, I was walking through Office Depot and I was like, hey, um, a 32 gigabyte USB isn't enough. Like, I would use that because I'm really selective about what I choose. Like, when I spin, I'm like, I'm, I'm like hyper selective. I'm like, this is what I'm playing today. Pass or fail, <laughs> and uh, so I go by <laughs> I go by 32 gigs. But 
Um, for all of you all who like uh, who do it by mood and stuff, I uh, put 64th just in case. Um, inside of the goodie bag, we have well, the goodie bag is, is just a bag, but we have one of our uh, home brewed teas. So we made this one. This is a apple spice uh, kratom, and um, we use all organic products. Um, this is a sample of our pumpkin spice kava. Um, this is a full serving of what we call the Tony Montana, which, like, honestly, let me be real, this shit will fuck you up. Um, <laughs> this is a disco biscuit, and these are alternatives to Adderall, ecstasy, and things like that. People use this to go to events and raves rather than go and use other products. This really is a lot better. It leaves you focused, it leaves you clear in your mind, and you still, like, dance and you feel really euphoric, but this has a blend of red and, red and green kratom in it. It's really strong, really great, great for dancing all night, honestly, or for really, really long study sessions. So that's one of these. And then um, this is uh, Achieve Balance is one of our sponsors. Um, Achieve Balance come, stems from Turntable FM. So one of the people who made um, Turntable FM went on and started doing different types of supplements. And um, yeah, this one's to calm you down. So while this is like to bring you up, this is to chill you out. And then I put um, <coughs> M&Ms in a lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it. Yeah, and if you have any questions on, you know, honestly, anything in the local industry, your local scene, um, I've been producing for, <laughs> I don't even know how long at this point. like. Yeah, thir 13 years yeah. making music for 15. I'm an analog person, so I work b basically on analog gear, and you know, my main doll is Logic. But if you're into music production, I'll be doing some sessions too. So, yeah. Um, so for whoever Thank wins. Thank you. <laughs> the raffle. Yes. Thank you. The raffle will also include a pair of Audio Technica headphones. So. $10 to enter. You don't have to enter more than once. I mean, you can if you want to win it really for real, for real. I think it's a good deal. If anybody ever, like, asked me to do $10 for all this stuff, I probably would have done it. So fun fact, all the proceeds will go directly to supporting the people in this panel. Thank you. Now's your chance to enter while we have a short intermission.